Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast sponsored by Aveda, letting you know as you file in that you are in the right place. We're going to allow a little bit more time for people to get settled and get things going in about a minute from now. Hello once again, everyone. Letting you know as you file in, you are in the right place. Just going to allow a little more time for folks to get settled and get things going in another 30 seconds. All right, well, now an official hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast, How to Make Your Safety Training Stick, sponsored by Aveda. My name is Kevin Drulli. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. In a few minutes, we'll start a presentation, but first, let's review some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and may not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not necessarily mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to ask, I'm sorry, you don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we may not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speaker. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and we'll let you know more about that after the presentation. The webcast today will be archived, so you can access it after the live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, please visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Linda Tapp. Linda serves as president of Safety Fundamentals, an online shop with training games, activities, and books for safety professionals. She's a safety pro who brings more than 30 years of experience and is a frequent speaker and writer in the OSF space. Linda also is vice president of finance for the American Society of Safety Professionals. Again, we thank you all for tuning into this presentation. Linda, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Sure, thanks. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are here today to talk about how to make your safety training stick. And what that really means is how to get your trainees to remember the information that you're sharing with them during training sessions. Because if they're not remembering, it's really a waste of your time, it's a waste of their time. And we'll talk about a few other things that, that can really be the outcome of having your information not be remembered. So to get started, I want you to think about a training class that you delivered in the last six months. All right, so hopefully you have something in your head. Now that you have that, think about what do you think your trainees remembered from that class? How much of that content do you think? I, I asked this question recently to someone, they said maybe 10%, which is really scary when you think about it, if you spend hours training people and they're remembering that little. So why is that? Why do people forget the information that we're sharing with them? That's because of something called the Ebbinghaus Forgetting Curve. And this was identified more than 100 years ago, but it's been reproven and, and restudied. People keep thinking, you know, this can't be right, but this is generally the graph that you're going to see, and it explains why people don't remember. So if you look at this graph, let me move my, my, my head down here. Um, if you look at the graph after day seven, right, that's about 10%. That's what people are going to remember after seven days. And that's traditional training. That's like lecture type training, which unfortunately is how much of, of training is done where people sit in a class and someone just talks at them. So if that's the kind of training that you are being told to deliver, people aren't remembering a whole bunch of that. So what's the problem that people forget? You know, when it comes to safety and health, it's a little bit different than if you delivered sales training to a bunch of say car salesmen and they forgot the training, right? They're not gonna sell a car. If they forget their safety training, what could happen? And, and I'd like you to kind of start answering these questions in the Q&A as we go along, because we have interactivity built into this, probably more than you're used to, but I'd like you to put your answers to that in the Q&A so I can see what some of the responses are. So again, what I'm asking is, if people forget their safety training, what, what could happen? What's the problem? Why do we care? So I'll give you about 10 seconds to put some answers in there and I'll check.
I see injuries, death, right? Injuries, great, workers get injured, right? So you're, you're all right on the money, right? It's, it's a lot different than if it's just some kind of other workplace training that doesn't have the big negative effects. Oops, let's go back here. All right, like accidents, time, and money, that's the big three, right? Someone doesn't pay attention in training or they forgot their training, it's going to lead to workplace accidents. It's also a waste of time, which I mentioned earlier, and time is money. It's your time as a trainer, and it's their time. You're pulling them off the job, you're pulling them off the line, and it's wasted time if no one's getting anything from it, other than you checking a box or management being able to check a box. So we're gonna talk about making it stick, which really means retention. So it's how you're gonna get people to remember the important information that you're sharing with them. All right, but first we're gonna have a quick quiz. So you get quiz two during this. And remember, what is the Ebbinghaus curve? Anybody wanna put that in the, the Q&A box? I can see if you remember the answers for all three of these. And how much content is remembered after seven days and the three problems of forgetting. Good, retention over time, right? That's the Ebbinghaus curve. How much content? Let's see if anybody got that one yet. I don't, oh, 10%, great, thank you. And then the three problems of forgetting, see if they're down here. Yep, money time injury is perfect. So you'll also see on this quiz that on the left column, it shows a confidence rating. And this is just a, a small trick to help you get people remember the information longer. So if I had asked you, put the confidence rating in the left column for how confident you are that that answer is correct right? That would actually, in the long term, help you remember the information and the correct answers longer. So say for the Ebbinghaus curve, you signed in late, you have no idea, and you put down 5%. You're 5% confident that you knew the answer. When we go through the final answers, you're going to pay more attention to see if you were right or not. So it's really easy to change some of your quizzes and however you evaluate employees to have that little confidence rating column on the left-hand side. And ask people just to rate simply how confident they are. If they're 100% confident, they're going to want to look too to see if they're right in the end. Okay. So retention techniques we're going to talk about today are reinforcement, real world spacing, retrieval practice, and reduction. First one's repetition. And if you think about learning something with repetition, what's one of the first things that you think about? Right? For many people like me, it was way back in grade school learning how to do multiplication table, right? I see somebody monotonous, right? That's a good answer. It very much is. It's, it's really not a lot of fun to learn something through repetition. So think when you're learning times tables, right? Three times three, four times four, five times five. Can you do that with safety trainees? Not necessarily. And you, you would drive them crazy if you sat them in a room all day and just repeated the same information over and over and over. And it can be effective, but like someone said in the chat, it's very monotonous. So something called spacing is a better way to do that. So you can repeat the information but you space it out over time. And it, it's really the same technique for anything that you're trying to study. Say you're studying for a certification exam, you don't wanna sit there and just read the same information hour after hour after hour. If you can space it out a few days here, maybe a week later, as much as you can put space in between those study sessions or those learning sessions, it's going to help it stick much longer. Um, there's something called distributed practice, which is the same thing as spacing. So you're not just practicing all in one session. And distributed practice is greater than cramming. And I always joke that this is how I got through college was through cramming. Uh, I would do the Friday night, Saturday night, all night, giant bottle of Mountain Dew and just try to get through it. But I would pass the test, right? So is that successful? It's successful for passing a test. But if you had asked me a few days later, if I remembered any of that content, I would have no idea. I would be at that 10% or lower number. So when it comes to safety, sure, you can cram stuff all day in an eight hour session, people can pass a test, but if they need to use that information a month later, it's not gonna be there. So it's really important that we don't try to put too much information onto trainees and expect them to learn it. Then they really have the chance to digest it and, and spacing it out is much better. So to try to keep that in mind when you have especially long, long classes. Reinforcement was the second way we were going to discuss and I'll show you an example of that. So. Reinforcement isn't how you would train somebody flat, you know, straight off on a certain topic. So say you were doing fire extinguisher training. You wouldn't just put up a fire extinguisher poster and say, okay, you know how to use it, right? This is, this is fire extinguisher training. Um, this is more to reinforce something that you already told them. So the same for the face coverings. 
Um, these are simple face coverings in this illustration, but you generally wouldn't tell somebody for respiratory protection, this is how you're trained by putting up a poster. It's all to reinforce something that they heard in the past. And one of the, the key things you can do with reinforcement um, in the form of posters that you see here, and, and many people use workplace posters as a form of safety communication, is to make them a little bit more difficult. So if you look at the slide here, you'll see the PASS acronym, which probably most people on this call are familiar with or even learned how to use fire extinguishers with that acronym. But look what's underneath each letter, right? Pull the blank, right? But if you want to put answers in the, the chat, I know you know these. A, aim at the blank. S, squeeze the blank. And the final S, sweep blank, right? We got some answers, right? Pull the pins, the first one. So if you're going through these activities in your mind or your trainees see a poster like this with some of the words missing, you can think right now for yourself, what process did you use to actually figure out those right answers? Right, so every time that you try to pull an answer out from your, your brain, from your mind, it's making more, more connections that are gonna help that information stick and be remembered longer. So if you are going to do reinforcement, like a poster, don't simply put up the plain poster, make them work a little bit for it to remember the information and it'll really help increase their retention. So retrieval practice is the next one we're gonna talk about. And retrieval practice is really kind of like I just mentioned, we use reinforcement there and made you remember some of those empty words, retrieving the information from your, your memory. Um, but evaluations are the big way that we can do retrieval practice. And if you said to a group of trainees, all right, it's time for a quiz, it's time for a test, they are not gonna be happy, right? Most people get a little nervous. They don't like to take tests, they don't wanna be quizzed. But evaluations are really a great way to help them remember the information in the end. And there's three big times you can use them as a pretest, as a test in the middle of the class, which will help you know if they're getting the information, if you need to spend time on some area or tweak something. And the typical place most people use tests are after the class is done, so the post test. So, what I'm going to show you are you see the two examples up here that are small? I'll show you a bigger one in a second. Uh, these are crossword puzzles, and one is something I call a crazy crossword, which is reverse puzzle. These are really great ways to test people. And it looks like a game or you know, something that's fun, but it's really a test. It's the same questions just put into a crossword puzzle form. So I call these sneaky tests. People tend to get less stressed out. If they see something like this because it's familiar, they don't think it's a test, but it's just a really good way to still evaluate how much information that they know or don't know. So I mentioned pretest here. If you have people coming to class that have been to this class 10 times, I know everything, Start it off with one of these puzzles and see how they do. If they fly through it and know all the answers, great. But if they don't, you know where you can focus your particular training topic for that day. So again, about better retrieval practice, we mentioned the blanks on the poster. I wanted to show you these two examples as well. So you look on the left, what is the Ebbinghaus curve? I think you know that already. And how much content is remembered after seven days? So versus the versions on the right. What is the Ebbinghaus curve? A roller coaster, the graph for learning versus retention, an electric car, right? So if I gave you the question that way, most likely you would get it right, right? I think almost anybody would probably get it right. The bottom one, how much content you remembered after 30 or 50%, that's a little trickier, but the correct answer is still in front of you, right? It's much, much easier to pick a correct answer out of a group of multiple choices than to have to fill in the blanks. So if you have any control over the test or the quizzes that you're giving your trainees, try to make them a little bit harder, have them fill in the information and not just have to identify the correct answer in a, in a certain group of options. So back to the quiz we had before, right? This is repetition, Ebbinghaus, how much after seven days, what's the three problems with forgetting? You're probably all getting them like that, right? Because we're going through it. So this is just another refresher that we're just throwing in one more time. So I want to share this quote with you by Peter Hollins, who is, I like to think of the follower of accelerated learning. And a lot of the games and activities that I all talk about is really based on something called accelerated learning. And if you're interested in learning more about that, check out his book right there, The Science of Accelerated Learning. So he says, the principal benefit of retrieval practice is that it encourages an active exertion of effort rather than the passive seepage of external information. Okay. So if I showed you the same quote this way, Right? Could you pick out the right answer? Right? Hopefully, we just went through it, but it's a lot easier when the three answers are in front of you. 
Now, if I showed it to you this way, you should be able to get the idea about how much harder it is. It encourages and blank, blank of effort, right? Rather than the passive seepage. So your mind works a little bit differently when you're trying to pull out that information than if you're just trying to pick it out of a group of options. So productive failure, something I wanted to mention. And I'll share this quote with you as well. This is from another book by a paper done by Bjork and Bork. Um, Techniques used to speed the rate of acquisition by trainees can fail to support long-term post-training performance. And the introduction of difficulties for trainees enhances post-training performance. Now think about yourself, right? When you're learning something new and you fail, it's frustrating, but you're probably gonna remember what to do differently the next time. So by us building in a little bit of difficulty into the materials that we share when we're doing training, it's going to help people in the long term. So don't be afraid of failure. Also, when we do failure in training, you're helping people learn to be a little more at ease or vulnerable with failing because sometimes you think, oh, we can't fail. No one can make mistakes. But it's not always bad to make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. Lessons learned are a great thing to throw into safety training. So productive failure isn't a bad thing. So just keep that in mind when you're worried about making something too hard. So again, building in negative outcomes can increase comfort level, level with vulnerability and failure. You want to introduce some challenging opportunities specifically to let participants struggle. And I'm going to show you some activities and have you do a little bit of struggling yourself. So hopefully you can participate even though you're sitting at home or in your office. And again, interactive safety training games are a great way to do this. Um, it's really a low risk. If someone loses a game, or doesn't do well in a safety training activity, nothing bad is going to really happen. Um, it's not like a safety emergency or something terrible. So it's a really good way to build in people getting used to not doing really well. The so real world is another option. This is us really adding in what they're familiar with. So I always give the example of, say you work in a warehouse. You would not use an off-the-shelf video of a bakery or a hospital, right? You want to have things be very, very familiar and recognizable to your workforce. It's gonna get their attention more and they're going to be able to remember the information longer. If you showed someone in a warehouse how to lock out a, a mixer in a bakery, it's not gonna stick as long as it would as if you showed something that they do every single day. Um, these are some examples of how you can throw in real world situations. These are three different workplaces. And if you, you can find a photo or take a photo or even stage a photo of people that they work with doing their day-to-day -day job it's really gonna draw them in. Hey, I know that person, I recognize that facility. You can have them analyze these pictures. Um, look at the woman on the right sitting. Right? If you've had any kind of training in ergonomics, you might notice some stuff going on there. So even if it's not their facility though, it's a real person, which I always prefer over stock photos. And they start to look and they start to analyze and they help, it helps them to really remember and focus things more, especially if it's their own, their own workplace. Reduction is another method for retention, and this is just breaking stuff down. And I mentioned these marathon eight-hour classes before, and sometimes we have to do that because that's all you have trainees for. Maybe you have them a day a year and just say, all right, do everything in eight hours. That, that's really, really hard because people aren't going to remember information. So if it's at all possible, try to break down those big hunks of training content into smaller pieces. If you have to do the eight hours, I would do some follow-up with reinforcement because that's not all gonna stay in their mind, and I'll show you an example. So say you're doing a class on GHS labeling, right? Instead of trying to cover, cover all those labels in a day, if you could space out that information, day one, cover one of the symbols, what it means, when to use it, day two and day three. And maybe that means you don't do a full sit down class. Maybe you do it by text, maybe you do it by email, toolbox talk. There's a lot of ways to break down the information into smaller pieces, because when you give people too much information, they, they can't. I mean, you know yourself, you can't digest all that information and be able to spit it out clearly the next day or a week later. So this is one way to, to break stuff down with repetition and with chunking. And I just showed you the GHS labels. Anything that is more memorization is a really good idea for repetition. So things like GHS labels or mobile crane hand signals, things that people just really have to memorize in order to be able to use. You can set up flashcards, and this is from an activity that I like to do where you make up flashcards, the correct answers on the back, you give a set to two different teams of trainees, and we'll talk about teamwork shortly, and you just basically have them show the other team the card. If they know the correct answer, they get to keep the card. 
If not, the other team gets the card. And whoever gets the most cards in the end is, is the winner. So it's just, it's a fun way to throw in repetition. But again, it's really good for things that people just have to purely memorize. So a little quiz for you again, a little mental quiz. What are a few ways to increase retention? And if you pop them in the Q&A, we can see how many you remember. Reduction, good, we got one. Facing your petition reinforcement, real world. All right, all right, I think we're, we're pretty on target. Go to the next one. These are the ones I hear most often, right? Repetition, reinforcement, retrieval practice, real world, and reduction. And then usually the one that somebody already put in the Q&A that I see, maybe you all didn't get this one. There's one that's usually missing. And can you guess what that is and why? I'll show you in a second. That one's spacing. And if you can guess, the other ones are all ours. They tend to be remembered longer. And spacing is the one that most people tend to forget. So again, See, I'm torturing you now with this repetition. What, one second, what were the six ways? All right, repetition, reinforcement, reduction. I can talk really fast. I can run through them, spacing and realistic, right? You get it. So back to teamwork. I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk about teamwork a little bit. And you'll see when we go through some of the activities, it's hard because we're spread out all over the place. That teamwork is really important when you're using safety training activities. And for a few reasons that I do almost everything in a team. First. I never want to embarrass anybody with a training activity. If someone feels, I think, not incompetent, it's not the right word, but embarrassed or unsure, or unconfident that they can't do the activity, they're going to shut down and really stop learning. So you don't want to ever put someone in that stressful situation of not being able to do an activity. So when you're in a team, there's safety in numbers, right? There's also a large literacy problem in the U.S. And people don't really realize that, that a large percent of workers in the U.S., don't read above a fifth grade level. So if you give somebody a written activity, there's a lot of really big safety words and we have a lot of big safety and health words out there. You don't want them to struggle and not be able to do the activity on their own. So I must always do things with teamwork. So when it comes to teams, here's another question for you. What do you think is the ideal number for a team? I see a five, any other guesses for the ideal number? Three, four, five, six. Yeah, you're all right on the money. It's, it's four to six is the ideal size. And you can probably guess why you wouldn't want a team of eight or nine people. If you've ever been in a team of eight or nine people yourself, what happens, right? Some people sit in the back, be on their phone, not participate. It's uh, really easy to hide if you have a group that big. If you have a group that's really small, say two people, sometimes one person can be very much more, let's say involved or domineering over the other person. So it's really good to have a group that's not too big, not too small, like four to six is the, is the good size. So a few activities for improved retention that we're going to talk about, and, and these are different facilities where people have done activities. So one of the things I hear sometimes from people are like, that would never work in my facility. My trainees would never do the activities. They're not those kind of people. I want you to just give it a try and have an open mind. One of the, the first times I did training activities was with a group of employees, and I joke and say they look like the Soprano extras. Um, this was in a place where they actually filmed part of the Sopranos, and this class walked in, big tough guys, arms crossed, did not want to be there, and I'm, all right, we're going to do lots of activities. Um, the look on their face was priceless in the beginning, but after the end of the day, several did say how much they appreciated actually being able to get up, move around, participate in this, this three-day-long session, which is really long anyway, than to have to sit there and just watch video after video or listen to lecture after lecture. So give it a try. You might think people won't like it, but give it a try. I've never had a class that people were, I'm not doing this. Um, these are all different kinds of people you see on the screen um, and it works. You can modify these activities to make them harder, easier, longer, shorter. So um, if you need help too, my contacts in the end, I'm happy to help you really modify for what you need. So these are the ones we're going to talk about today. Uh, reverse crossword, safety sequence, safety bingo slash lotteria, what's next, A to Z race, label master, and training tutor. And to show you how these tie into what I've just been talking about, reverse crossword is a form of retrieval. Uh, safety bingo lotteria is retest or evaluations. Teamwork is the A to Z race, repetition, it's flashcards. Training tutor is a form of reduction, real world, what's next? And reinforcement is safety sequence. 
So we'll get started. So I showed you the crossword earlier as being a form of evaluation or a way to quiz people. Reverse crossword is just what it sounds like. So instead of giving people a crossword puzzle, you're giving them the answer key and you're giving them the blank lines to the right. So you're asking them to write the clues for that crossword. So this is a lot harder than it looks. And actually I've been told it's a lot harder than trying to do the actual crossword puzzle. But take a look at say three across, right? Lab code. How would you write a clue for lab code? If you want to throw that in the q and I'll see if someone has a good, or pick any other one. One down is latex. If you want to write a clue for latex, that would be good. See PPE, right? But that's a good, good start, right? A lot of words would fit in there for, for PPE. Lab PPE, that's good too. But when you're doing that process, right, you're thinking you have to know what lab code is and what it's used for. So it's helping people retrieve the information that they have previously learned. Um, it's just another way really to sneak in a quiz, uh, sneak in how much they know or an evaluation. So really easy to do. Uh, there's lots of free crossword puzzle makers online, just, just Google them. And when you wanna use a reverse one, you're just giving them the answer key and a space to write their, their clues next to it. So I said, we give it a try. You see the first one, a code to protect street clothes, someone told me uh, for lab coat, that's, that's an example. Safety sequence is one that I really like and trainees tend to really enjoy this one and get really, can move myself over there, really competitive. So what are some examples of procedures that must be done in a particular order? That's the first thing I'd like you to share. And I'll give you one example, uh, lockout tag out. Right? A lot of places have a very particular order for the steps of lockout tag out. So what other things involve a certain order of steps? See lockout, yeah, confined space entry, yeah, good. Yeah, donning PPE, good. Uh, fire extinguisher use, spill cleanup, right? All really good examples. So anything that involves a certain set of steps you can use safety sequence with. So just to show you how this started, on the left is a energy control procedure, which is lockout, tag out for a facility that I was working with. And that shows 10 steps for this facility for lockout tag out. And different facilities have different numbers of steps. The order may change slightly, but generally not too much. So instead of having people try to remember and try to train someone on this form, you can take each step and make it into an image, or you could even just put the words on a, on a card. So in the case of lockout tag out, each one of these images shows one of those 10 steps of lockout tag out. So this is going to be our first at home, at work activity. These are the 10 steps and they're not in order on the screen. Each one has a letter next to it. So I wanna give you a minute or two to really try to figure out what the correct order of these steps should be. So if for example, I'm just picking randomly, F is first, you're gonna come back in the Q and A and put F is your first one. But if you can figure out all 10, you know, F, A, B, D, G, put them in the order that you think that they should be. So it's 128 now Eastern time, I'm gonna give you until 129, if you can go that fast, maybe 130, if we don't get any answers. And I just want to see if you can go through this process and figure it out. So I'll keep an eye on the Q&A. If you need help, put a question in there too. Okay, we'll give you one more minute. Interesting people that are getting answers in here really quickly. I'm curious if you're electrical safety experts because some people are much quicker. Uh, it's much easier to do, let's see.
Okay, it's 1.30 and it's interesting. I don't think any of the answers I see in there match the other answers, right? Which is very often what happens. So if you do an activity like this in uh, your training class, I really like to try to have teams of trainees be the same number of the number of steps. So in this case, it's 10 steps, right? 10 steps. So if you have 10 people per team, if you're lucky enough to have a class that big, you know, have each team have 10 cards and then you give each card or each step to one of those people. And generally, if you might have saw in one of the earlier pictures, people have to stand up in the correct order from start to finish, right? So the first step is the first person and they tend to rearrange themselves. It's interesting to see how the teamwork works and how they discuss amongst themselves who goes where. And almost always, I'd say 99% of the time, the teams don't have the right answers. So I see here, I'll give you the right answers in a second. In, in that case, what do you think happens if they don't have the right answers? They start to argue sometimes and they start to debate. Um, people can be more competitive and actually competition can be a really good thing in a training class because if they're arguing over safety, like that's awesome, right? How often do people argue over safety? So they really learn a lot from each other and that's a core principle of accelerated learning. You want them to talk together, to discuss together and then share with the rest of the group. So um, this activity works great. I said it's really, um, this was pictures that we had done but you can sketch your own pictures you can have people do those steps in your workplace and take a photo of it and use the same kind of thing. Um, you can also use words and I'll show you that in, in a second. But all right, the right answers, if you're ready, if you want to check your work, are C, G, I, J, D, F, B, H, A, and E. And before you start arguing or complaining, um, this is this facility's 10 steps. So facility um, process it where you work might be different. So this is how that facility does their lockout, tag out in those 10 steps. And again, C, G, I, J, D, F, B, H, A, E were the technical correct answers. But the value generally is really in the discussion part that comes from doing something like this. Let's move on to this one. So why were there different answers? These are some great ways to talk about the activity after you do it in a class setting. And that's called debriefing. If you haven't heard that phrase debriefing, whenever you do a safety training activity, you want to debrief it. So really people understand what they just learned or why they just did that activity. So different answers, right? Different experience. You have older employees, younger employees, as in time on the job. Um, a lot of reasons, but it leads to good discussion. How do you determine who is right? You can see the teamwork in process. How can you make it more difficult? You can do stuff with a lot of steps. Um, one way to make it really hard is if you want to remove a step or two and tell them they also have to figure out what step is missing. And then you can have them try to illustrate that if you want to make it extra hard. Um, also, you can make them race, make them go fast. You can do a really short activity. Um, that's what it comes down to making it easier. You can do really something really, really simple. So let me show you some variations for this. So if you don't have those activities illustrated like I just showed you, you can do words. This is a um, lifting one, a very simple one for how to lift a box. Um, it's written out in words. And I just did this the other day. You get a pack of post-it notes. You just handwrite the steps for whatever activity you're training and mix up the post-it note order, give a set to each group and have them work together to put them in the correct order. And as you see on the left, I really like to have people get up and stick them on the wall because getting people out of their seats is going to help them pay more attention. It's going to keep them awake, keep them involved. And people can just line up by their by their post-its. If you have any skills in drawing or know what says home one who does, you can do the stick figures to illustrate the same thing. So really cheap, really inexpensive activity. It helps people think about what they just learned and the order, but it really leads to some great discussion. So safety bingo and safety lotteria is the next one I'm going to talk to you about. And many of you have probably played safety bingo, right? Usually it's very random. People pull out a number and say B5. K-12, can you cross off the, the box? So this is a, a typical safety bingo one for heat stress, right? These are clues, which are just, this is another kind of quiz, actually. These are clues, and then people have to find the answer on their bingo card. If they know the answer, they cross it off. You keep reading random clues until someone has five across, five down, five diagonal. This is one based on five. You can make bigger bingo cards or shorter bingo cards. And there's a site called bingobaker.com. Um, again, bingo baker, because people always run there and, and do it. And you can create free bingo cards through that website. So in this example, you'll see how long to recover from heat stroke. If you knew the answer, you go process that off. How long should, 
how much water should you drink to stay hydrated, right? I'm trying to read behind the, the X's up there. You can see the, the general answer. So hopefully that makes sense. It's another way of quizzing. You can have them do it in a team. This one, sometimes I do individually just because it's not as obvious if someone is really struggling. It's a great way to review the information in the end. The Safety Lotteria is a similar version, but you'll notice it's image-based. And, and Lotteria is actually a Mexican bingo game. So it's, it's a real game and it's based on images. So this is just the safety version. And again, for people who don't speak or read English really well, having images is really important to help them get the information. So same general thing. What is the GHS symbol for health hazard? If they know it, they can cross it off. And again, this is a four by four square. So much easier. Um, Come back to this one for one second. So I had um, someone use this after they came to one of my sessions and said, you know, Linda, it was great. We used this activity, but everybody had bingo at the same time, right? Can anybody guess why, why that would happen? Look in the chat. I don't see that, but I'll, I'll tell you the answers because they just made a copy of the sheet and gave all the trainees the exact same lotteria sheet or the same bingo sheet, right? Someone says need to verify, randomize the square. So if you're using Bingo Baker, make sure that you make well, at least 10 different versions of the, of the bingo card, or otherwise everyone's going to be bingo all at, the, all at the same time. All right, what's next is another activity, and this again goes back to that real world activity. This was a workplace, and this was an activity I like to use um, with, with teams. Again, I make a copy of this photo or any photo of the workplace. Uh, for different groups in the class and say, all right, I want you to work together and tell me what do you think happened next? This was right before an accident happened. What do you think happened next? Okay, so we have a minute or two. So if you guys want to put some ideas in the Q&A, let me know what you think happened right after this picture was taken. Um, we'll see what you think. We got some really good ideas in there. All right, a lot of really different ideas too. We have spills, buckets falling over, uh, sack collapsing, um, dolly slips, you know, lots of various things, shoulder injury. So if you do this with a group of people and they come back to you with a whole wide variety of answers as well, how do you think that can lead to discussion, right? Same thing I would say to all of you. Why do you think some people picked out some potential hazards or potential accidents and other people found other things, right? So different people go in looking for different, different objects. If you have a history in fire safety, you might pick out something that are related to fire safety. If you've had ergonomics training, you might pick out the shoulder injuries. Um, it really comes from your experience and what people are looking for, but again, a lot of the value in these activities is the discussion that follows. Another way I like to use workplace photos such as this are to ask them to find the hazards. And that's probably pretty easy. Um, people love doing that, especially safety people love doing that. It, it takes them a while to come back from that activity because they get so wrapped up in finding the hazards that are in here. Um, after they find the hazards, you can also increase the discussion by saying, all right, what was done right? Because we are generally not looking for what's done right, unfortunately. We do inspections and audits and we're always looking for the bad stuff. But having people also learn to identify the good is, is a good practice to get into. Um, you can do this in any workplace, take a picture where there's a lot going on um, and there could have been an accident that happened after or not. Um, if you want the actual photo with a lot so people can visualize, oh, I do that every day. That's where I work, I know him. It ties some emotions into it as well, but you really wanna have it be as realistic to their workplace as possible. So label master is another one, and this comes down to chunking. Um, people, if you learn something, right? So say you talk about forklift safety controls during a forklift safety class, you want them to really understand where those things are on the forklift. So you can't bring a forklift into a, a room. So an easy way to do this is to give groups of trainees pack of post-it notes, say go out to the forklift and label all of the safety aspects of this forklift. Um, same thing for fire extinguisher, that's a much quicker, easier thing, and you can bring that into the training room, but have them, after you've presented the information, go back and label it. So it's just another good way to break down the information and have them apply real world to what you just told them. So teaching others is one of the, the best ways that you can learn information. And if you do safety training, you know that before you go deliver a safety training class, 
you are probably really learning that information, right? So anytime anyone has to present to their peers, especially, they are going to really learn and remember that information. So if you can give trainees an opportunity to share what they know with other people, either through teaching part of the class, um, sharing just knowledge, general knowledge, case studies, storytelling, it's really a good way to increase retention. And I wanted to share this pyramid with you, which many of you may have seen. This is the general pyramid. It's been quoted and cited for years and years and years about how people remember. So you'll see at the top is lecture, and you can probably agree that if you're sitting in a lecture, the amount of, that you remember is going to be lower than if you're teaching others, which is the very bottom of the pyramid. And you see what my head is blocking here? Um, actual percentages are debunked. So if someone says to you, oh, people remember 12% of what you told them five days after the lecture, or people remember 36%, you know, eight days later, all those numbers mean absolutely nothing. People have tried to find the original source of those numbers, but people just keep reciting previous bad reports. So the numbers mean nothing. People generally agree that this pyramid is how people remember more by these different delivery methods. So lecture, of course, is the worst because people are not just passive sponges that sit there and suck everything in. Reading, second, audiovisual. You see what the bottom ones are where we really start to increase retention. So interactive activities that we've been going through play into demonstration, discussion groups, practice by doing, and teaching others. So when you want people to remember, try to definitely build in at least a few of those bottom items. So again, interactive learning games can increase long-term retention rates by up to 10 times. A significant statistic when considering knowledge retention, which that's huge, right? If you can throw in a game or two that people are involved with, that's realistic, it's going to help them remember, which is really, really important when it comes to safety training. Here's our friend Albert Einstein, the way to learn the most when you're doing something with such enjoyment that you don't notice that time passes. So you have people in class, they're not looking at the clock, is this class almost over? If they're working with their peers, doing something fun, it's gonna make the time pass and they're really learning and they may not realize that they're learning the information. So we have some more retrieval practice for you. And I showed you that safety lotteria earlier. This is a safety lotteria version of what we talked about in the last 42 minutes. Um, to make this a little challenging, I'm going to show you what we have. These are 10 different QR codes. And if you get your phone and scan one of those codes, you will get your own lotteria form. I could just show you one form like that, but then we'd all have the same correct answers in the end, right? So I want you to scan one of these codes, pick a random code, and you will get a form in front of you. All right, so I'll give you a second to do that. And then I'm going to read you the clues and you're gonna to try to identify if you have those answers on your personalized safety lotteria form. All right, so, so Dan, I see for, for, the, or for the no scanning capability, after people get a chance to scan, I will go back to the previous slide so you'll have a version in front of you. All right, I'm gonna go back to the, let me see, I think I have it next to. All right, I have one next to. Here's a, a form, a generic form. So if you don't, if you can't scan the QR code and um, you just have a phone and put your camera up to the code, it should take you right to the site. If you don't, we'll just pretend this is your card. Um, we have a lot of people on the call and there's 10 different cards. So we're all gonna have some of the same cards anyway. But if you have a, a form in front of you, I'm gonna read you a clue. And if you know the answer, um, just imagine you're crossing it off, all right? If you think you get four in a row, uh, put it in the, the Q&A so we know that somebody got the correct answers. Okay, so I have a list of, of clues in front of me that go with each of these. If you're doing this live in a class, you can ask people to randomly give you a number and you can read that number. You can be fancier cut out each question, hold them up, put them in a bucket and draw them out like to be a little more random or I'm just randomly reading these clues on here. So first one, um, a sneaky way to get trainees, uh, sorry, a sneaky way to quiz trainees. So which one of those is a sneaky way to quiz trainees? Right, if you know it, you don't have to put it in Q&A, just mentally cross off that you have that box crossed off. Second one, um, one of the, Seven R's of increasing retention that involves chunking material. So if you're gonna chunk material to help people remember, see if you know what that square was. All right, next one. These are a form of reinforcement commonly found in the workplace. 
Again, these are a form of reinforcement commonly found in the workplace. Okay, next one. Trainees can often learn more effectively this way. And I'll add some more hints in there. It says when they learn from each other. So trainees can learn more effectively this way and learn from each other. If anybody thinks they get four across, uh, just tell us in the Q&A, please. And I'll stop reading questions. Um, something commonly lost when training isn't effective. So one of those three things I talked about that you lose when training is not effective. All right. Um, when someone learns by getting something wrong, it is called, right? That goes back to the struggle. When someone learns by getting something wrong, what is that called? All right, how about this graph represents how much is forgotten over time? Again, this graph represents how much is forgotten over time. Anybody getting close? and have at least three in a row, maybe two. I said you could pop in the QA and just tell us if you're getting closer to having four across, four, four down, or four on the diagonal. Somebody has three, good, so we're getting close. Let me pick another random one. Um, a type of safety bingo game that uses images. Again, a type of safety bingo game that uses images. All right, I'll keep going. An activity that involves post-it notes as a way to check knowledge. Filthy three. Oh, bingo, good, congratulations. Congratulations to the bingos that popped up. Um, so hopefully you can see how this works. I'm not gonna read back through the correct answers, but this is really everything that we covered. And it's a good way to review with your trainees. It's fun, it's a little bit of competition. It's always good to add in some, some randomness to how people win. So, you know, who knows what answer I'm going to pull out next and read. If it's all based on skill, it's really heavy on the test. If it's add in some, you know, randomness, like rolling dice, things like that, it throws in a little bit more of the, the game part and the, the fun part of it. So help you see how that works. Again, you can create these with bingobaker.com, which I have no affiliation with at all. It's just a great free website for creating bingo cards. Um, let me go back to this last activity that I wanted to show you. This is one of my favorites for wrapping up activities. Um, again, really cheap. The stuff I've told you about today costs nothing. It's not fancy technology or anything like that. To do this activity called A to Z review, all you need is a piece of paper and you put your training, training group into teams. You have each team have the paper with the line down the middle and A to M down one side and N to Z down the other. So we'll go through this just for a few minutes. If you want to start throwing answers in the Q&A, we can do it as a group. I always make this one a race because it's usually at the very end. People are getting a little tired. When I tell them there's a race, and especially if you have some kind of prize, people will work really hard together as a group to get this one done. So you ask them to put down any word or phrase that begins with those letters and see who can finish the fastest, right? And people, get, people look at their notes, which isn't a bad thing. They can dig back through their notes and they're reinforcing what they learned already. They talk amongst themselves. People get very creative on how they think of these letters. So you'll see the first one, A, accelerated. I talked about accelerated learning. Any idea what you would put for anything else on here? B, C, D, E, what word you put in? Contributed, bingo, great. How about some Cs, Es, Fs? Let's see what else we have here. Yeah, bingo baker, chunks, right? So when you're doing this activity yourself even, you're probably going through, what did we just talk about? So it's making you think, it's making you retrieve the information longer. And by retrieving it again, you're increasing retention. So hopefully when you go to work on your future safety training programs and trying to design in some interactivity, you're going to be able to remember a little bit longer. As you see, create team, evaluate, good. Now I'm curious if anyone can think of an X or a Z because they usually give people a lot of trouble. Uh, I'll tell trainees to be creative with X and Z. Let's see how creative you all are with those two letters. I see Zealous, that's a good one. I see Label Master for L, good. D, Domino, Art Retrieval, C, Content, good. X, Bingo, LOL, I like that one too. Um, xylene, good. A fabulous, Xerox, good. Is zero confidence, yeah. So it, sometimes it can be pretty funny. People have done um, exit, you know, with the X, um, exactly. Like they get very 
interesting with their spelling sometime, but I think that's all fine. Again, the idea is that they're remembering the information and they're discussing it with their peers. Finally, that, that is the end of my formal presentation to you. This is how you can reach me. Um, I do send out a monthly safety training newsletter with activities and ideas, but I'm always happy to help anybody. If you have a specific topic, I probably have something in my file of a jillion games and activities that I can send you for something special. So don't hesitate to email me and reach out and let me know how I can help you. Uh, I think we have time for Q&A, right? We have 10 minutes. If anybody wants to put any questions in there, I can try to answer them for you. Well, yeah, excellent. Great job, Linda. Thanks Thank for sharing you. your, your insights and your expertise. Before we do start the Q&A, just want to let everyone know about the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey will open in a different screen after the webinar. Your input is very important as it helps us improve our future webcasts. Um, again, you all should be familiar with, with the good old Q&A button at the bottom of the screen just from Linda's presentation. But as she indicated, if you'd like to ask a question here in the next few minutes, just type that question and click the send button to submit. If we don't get to the question today, the unanswered questions will be forwarded along to Linda. And now we will get to those questions. To start, how can refresher training be more interesting? Refresher training is one thing that I think people struggle with a lot because a lot of times if you've done it, you know, people show up thinking, why am I here? I've been here before. I've heard everything before. So, so one of the good things to do with groups like that are something like the training tutor that I mentioned earlier. You want to have people really share what they already know and teach other people. So say you have a group of 20 people coming to refresher training. I would put them in teams and one team create an introduction. One person talk about topic one, two, or three of the class, have another team work on making a quiz or like a final test, have maybe one team come up with an activity if you if they're used to doing activities, but really put the work back on them. So as a trainer, it's great for you, you can rest a little bit. And then when, it's, when they've had some time to work on that, just go through and order. All right, you read the introduction, you present. Who's doing topic one, two, or three, you present. So you're covering the information and you're also learning what they don't remember really well. So if they're struggling, you can focus on that part of the refresher training. I, I see one question in here I wanted to add in real quick. Yes, Bingo Baker. Yes, Bingo Baker is what it, what it is. B-I-N-G-O-B-A-K-E-R. Okay. And Bingo Baker was its name. Oh, sorry. Yes, no. yes. <laughs> um, next, next question. Um, what are some ideas for training activities for multilingual audiences? I think that's more and more common as most people know. I've had people tell me that they have six, seven languages in their facilities or that they're working with. So that's why you really need to lean on the images. Um, Image-based safety training is, is super important. As I mentioned, even not just for multilingual audiences because there's a liter literacy problem that we often don't talk about. And sometimes you might not even know um, that something happened. I've heard stories from other trainers where someone comes up to them and says, I can't do this, I can't read. And they might never have known that information. So. Focus on the images. If you use images, we can talk about images all day. You don't want to use just fluffy images like decorative stuff. You want to have something that's very, very close or exact to the content. So say you're talking about electrocution, right? You wouldn't want to show just a skeleton with a bolt going through, right? Because if someone didn't speak English, they're not necessarily going to look at that skeleton you know, clip art and know that that's electrocution. So you always want to find a very closely related image and make it as clear as possible. And also, if you use images, it's very helpful to put a small amount of text next to them. There's the image superiority effect, it's called, and it shows that people remember much longer, even if they understand you know, English fine, if you put a small amount of text next to the image that it goes with. We are getting a few more questions, but also some, some comments. Um, a couple of people just indicating that they love the session. They really appreciate the yeah, interactivity and, and the practicality things they can use right now. Yes, good. Yeah, thanks everybody for participating. I know doing this virtually is a little different than if we're doing it live. I think we're all getting really used to that. Now, if you do it yourself, it is a little trickier than doing it in class. Hopefully you can do it all in class. Next question asks, how often do you do a review for an eight hour class? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. If you mean review, but like for an eight hour class, I would throw an activity in there every 12, 15 minutes, which sounds crazy, but reviews can be very, very short as well. Because if you give them much longer than that, they start to zone out and may not pay attention. So on longer classes, I would throw in a lot of a lot of interactivity. And it can be as simple as asking a question and having them discuss it with their neighbor. It doesn't have to be a full-blown you know, 20-minute thing that like we just talked about. 
Next one, they're using a hypothetical situation such as with forklift training, but it asks, how would you use this approach to combine hands-on training with a classroom setting? With, with things like that, there's something called the flipped classroom that some of you might be familiar with. If you can give them anything ahead of time before they actually come to the hands-on part, that's where I would combine those things. So for example, say you sent something out before and you wanted them to work on it, right? You can do the interactive part there or even have a, a pre-session that's virtual or in class before you go out and do the hands-on part of it. So as long as you build it in, um, I think that's how you could probably do something like hands-on forklift training and still throw this part into it, you know, the interactive part that increases retention. Forklift training, I think, generally tends to be very remembered anyway, right? Because it's hands-on. It's something they do every day. They get a chance to practice right away too, which is really important because sometimes with safety training, we'll teach them things that hopefully they never ever need to use, right? Like how to put out a fire. Hopefully they never need to do that. And if they don't get a chance to practice, it's not going to be remembered. Next question asked, just to briefly backtrack on the name of the Peter Holland's book and anything yeah. else you might want to add on It was The Science of Accelerated Learning. So we've been doing that from memory, but I'm pretty sure that's the name of it is The Science of Accelerated Learning. Another comment just from a former educator saying you're, you're right on target and excellent information and good reminders throughout. Thanks. Um, and I think most safety people, we never have any kind of uh, training on how to train, right? So many times you're just thrown in front of a group and says, here's the procedures, go do it. So I think even learning just a little bit of the basics can really help us all be much better safety trainers. Again, everyone, there is still some time to, to ask a question of Linda. And if you'd like to do that, just click to Q&A button, type your question and click send. Um, as we wait for, for any more, Linda, anything unsaid or just things pop into mind subconsciously? Um, not really. I think I think building stuff in sometimes is a little risky for some people. Honestly, they're, they're afraid to try it and afraid the reaction they're going to get. But I, as I said before, I've never had trainees be miserable. I mean, maybe you get the one little grumpy person in the back who doesn't want to participate, but generally people really like to be active. They don't want to sit there and just listen and listen and listen um, for hours on end and not get to participate. So, you know, they might complain about getting up and having to move, but movement is really good. Like, you know yourself, you, you can't doze off or fall asleep if you have to get up and move. So give it a try if you're hesitant. Um, start small, start with one activity maybe if you're really hesitant, but I think once you get used to it and your trainees start to enjoy the training classes, you'll be ready to add in more and more, you know, as you get more experienced. Next question, get, getting back to training, um, says my training mostly is virtually and with limited time, which can be challenging. What tips can you give me? Yeah, I would do, so what I mentioned earlier with the flip, if there's any way you can send them some stuff ahead of time, especially any kind of handouts, things they need to scan or work on, um, try to use some of that non-classroom time a little bit more so they can do a little of that ahead. Sometimes people send out all the information before and then the limited time virtually is just going through review, or you could have that whole review time just be activities, but they've had to have that information earlier. So that's a that's one way to, I think, try to you know get squeezed more out of a little bit of time that you may have been given to spend with them, unfortunately. I mean, like I said before, time is money, right? So people don't want to let people go sit in training for hours, even though it'd be really nice to have them that long. This next one kind of dives into some, some generational um issues in the in the workforce saying just that sometimes it's said that older people might learn different from younger people and technology and things. Um, how do you manage both when they're in a classroom like that? Yeah, I, I like to pair them up together. Honestly, I think if I have someone who's never seen a QR code before, you have them work with somebody younger than them. The same thing for experienced employees. If you have somebody who's been there 30 years, I like to have them with a new person. And we can talk a lot too about the influence of ambassadors, coaches, mentors, when they go back to the, the workplace, because if they sit in training and then they go back to work and no one's doing what they just learned about, it's really helpful to have somebody like that. So it's the same thing in a class. I like to kind of pair people who you'd never think about pairing together. I also don't like to have groups of friends hanging out because when you do the, the breakout stuff, they're just going to talk and talk and not, you know, do what they're supposed to do. So I try to mix them. I mix ages. I try to have as diverse group as possible. And they actually learn more from each other that way. Um, you mentioned like the young people might be better in technology. It's not always true. Um, they might learn a ton from the person who's been there for 40 years who has no idea how to, what a QR code is or how to scan it. So I do like to mix them up and it seems to work really well. Looks like we've got time for one more question if you're game. Um, 
how would you apply seven times seven ways? I'm not sure if I understand that one. Let's think what that is again. How would I apply seven times seven ways? Can you tell me more about that question? That's what they have. If, <laughs> yeah, if that I question or if you're still around. Um, to, to, oh, I'm sorry, present. Uh, uh, new Obama. information, seven times in seven different ways. Um, so say, I'm guessing you say you have to do a, a class every hour for seven hours. Um, on the same topic, maybe if you have a huge group of people, 100 people, and they come seven different hours, we'll see if I'm on board. Um, I would take these different activities, and almost all these activities you can modify for any topic at all. So pick the ones you like. You could do, you know, safety bingo for one of them. You could do the A to Z race on the second one. You could do safety sequence for the third one. So just really find the ones that, that are resonating, that are easy, and I would spread out the topic. It's like it's repetition, right? They're doing the same topic seven times but seven different ways. So it's going to keep their interest, but it's also going to help it stick a lot longer. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we have run out of time today. Sorry, we didn't get to everyone's questions, although I, we may have. I appreciate Sarah's help, especially with going through all the, the Q&A feedback today. But if there are any unanswered questions, be assured they'll be forwarded on to, to Linda. Once again, we hope that you take the time to fill out the evaluation survey that we mentioned and give us your feedback. Again, we, uh, we really appreciate it. With that, we end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Linda Tapp, everyone at Aveta, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.